On our first day at Sequoia National Park, we asked the ranger to tell us the must-sees. On their list was Maro Rock, which involved climbing 350 steps to the summit, where we'd get a 360-degree view that included the Great Western Divide. The first 30 or so steps were a breeze, and then I told Jacob and Michael, you go ahead. I'm going to take my time. And as I climbed, I noticed the really old rusty railing where there was one. And where there wasn't, you can bet that I was hugging the rock for dear life. I wasn't sure I was going to make it. Like, I really wasn't sure I was going to make it. You see, I am deathly afraid of heights. There were times I had to stop to gather my courage. One step at a time, the voice inside me said, until I finally made it to the top. And a line of people were waiting to take pictures at the very edge. And Michael and Jacob were at the front. And when they saw me, I think they were a little surprised. <laughs> Truth be told, I was shocked and totally exhilarated. I thought, if I can do this, if I can try something every day that scares me, maybe I can overcome my fears. So did I get over my fear of heights? Not yet. But knowing that I could do something that terrified me gave me courage for the next climb. Sometimes we choose to face our fears, and sometimes our fears come roaring right up to us, and we have no choice but to face them. And then we have to summon our courage and dig deep to find the strength to confront our demons. The liturgy of this day implores us to listen. The great shofar is sounded. A still, small voice is heard. This day, even the angels are alarmed, seized with fear and trembling as they declare, the day of judgment is here. It is nearly impossible for us to hear the still, small voice these days. Our world is loud and getting louder all the time. We are constantly bombarded by sounds and images, intrusions and interruptions, screaming rage and deafening shouts, and a lot of that volume feels like it is being maliciously directed towards us, towards Jews. Anti-Semitism in our country has moved from being a low, steady hum to a sound we cannot shake. Anti-Semitism is now national news. In the past week alone, there have been numerous articles. Brett Stevens in the New York Times, Dara Horn in the Atlantic, and the Washington Post calling America's attention to what has become an all too common occurrence for us. Swastikas painted on a neighborhood walking trail, on the schools our congregants attend, on local synagogues. And now, even accusations and conspiracy theories about Jews orchestrating hurricanes and benefiting from recovery efforts. It has become an everyday horror. Barry Weiss calls anti-Semitism the oldest hatred in the world because individual people have sustained it in every generation. It cannot be defeated until we look these people and their ideologies in the face. The word anti-Semitism has started to feel clinical to me. I recently heard another phrase that seems more apt, more descriptive, more true, and a lot scarier. Jew hatred. That term concerns me because it feels like a stronger manifestation of anti-Semitism. It connotes violence and visible incidents. It feels more personal. What does Jew hatred look like to you, feel like to you? My freshman year of college, a classmate patted me on the head, and I asked him what he was doing. And he said, you're the first Jew I've ever met. Where are your horns? Now, I had no idea what he was talking about. I actually had to ask the Hillel rabbi, who explained that Jews were routinely portrayed with horns in medieval Christian anti-Semitic imagery to associate Jews with the devil. There is a distinction between ignorance and intentionality. Did I think this friend was anti-Semitic? No. Do I think he was misinformed, believed the lies he had been taught? 
Yes. So I spent the next four years setting him straight. <laughs> Post-October 7th, there has been a 200% increase in anti-Semitic incidents with over 10,000 reported. And if that doesn't get your attention, you should be aware that on college campuses alone, since October 7th, 2023, there has been a 500% increase in the number of incidents of Jew hatred. And according to the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, anti-Semitic incidents in the US increased over 1,000% between 2013 and 2023. When anti-Semitism is mainstreamed, it becomes even more dangerous. And it has become mainstream. Are we really reading news stories with quotes that say Jews could be blamed for the outcome of a national election? That is pretty front and center. And this type of rhetoric only feeds the fire. And the flames are getting hotter. This summer, while I was on faculty at URJ Camp Harlem, the ninth grade campers went on a trip to Philadelphia. And while they were at Reading Terminal Market, a few of the kids overheard people saying some terrible, horrible, even threatening things after they noticed the Hebrew on the back of the campers' shirts. The kids were upset, obviously, and when they returned to camp, I sat with a group of boys who were the, the cool campers, the ones who liked to joke around, show off for each other. Things didn't seem to bother these guys. And I asked them, have you ever seen or experienced anything anti-Semitic at school? They looked at each other. And then one quietly shared that someone in his school had yanked his Magain David, his Jewish star, from around his neck and broken it. Another boy told me he was standing at his locker when a group of older kids he didn't know walked by him. And one of them saw that he was wearing a Magain David, his own star, and came up close and whispered in his ear, free Palestine, free Palestine. It shook him up, especially when the kid did it again and again every time he saw him. And this camper was still visibly upset months later. And these boys told me that those types of incidents are causing students to hide their Magain David or their Chai, and I told them that I had heard about people who were hiding their kipot or taking down their mezuzah. I looked around the circle, and every one of those kids was wearing a Magain David. I love their Jewish pride. I love that despite what they had experienced, they had doubled down. That camper whose star was ripped off his neck, he got it fixed, and he put it back on. He wore it with pride. One part of confronting Jew hatred is doing just that. We cannot be complacent. We cannot pretend we don't hear it. We cannot afford to stick our heads in the sand and think, oh, it's not happening in my neighborhood, or my school, or my workplace. Or wonder if we heard that offhanded comment correctly. If we don't stand up, it gives air to those who hate us. It emboldens them if they think no one will stand up. We cannot wait and hope that someone will come to our rescue. We must rescue ourselves from the scourge of anti-Semitism. If you hear something at school, speak up. Go to a counselor or go to Hillel or Chabad for support, and we will speak up with you. If you see something at work, stand up. Go to HR, and we will stand up alongside with you. Because if it is happening to any of us, it is happening to all of us. As our Torah portion reminds us tomorrow, Atem Nitzavim Hayom Kulchem, we stand together, all of us, for all time. Over the past year, our Israeli colleagues from Or Chadash in Haifa came here to show their solidarity, to stand with us despite everything that was going on in their country because they saw the anti-Semitism that was happening here and how it was impacting us. They demonstrated that our resilience is not merely fortitude. It is our embrace of the concept, kol Yisrael, aravim zebaza, all Israel is responsible, one for the other. We show up, we speak up, we stand together. 
If this past year has taught us anything, it has taught us that there is strength in community. We see that in the increased popularity of websites like Hey Alma and Kveller, or in the number of Facebook groups that have popped up to address concerns about anti-Semitism, like End Jew Hatred and Mothers Against College Anti-Semitism. You may never have met, but right now there's a Jewish dad in Minneapolis and a Jewish mom in Houston who know exactly how you feel. And while the statistics about anti-Semitism are frightening, to be sure, there are equally dramatic statistics that tell an uplifting story. Here at Washington Hebrew, we have more people joining us for Shabbat than ever before. On average, over 200 Jews and spiritual seekers are filling our lobby and our prayer spaces each Friday night. Even on our sad days, this site, this community brings joy. We have over 40 conversion students, an impressive number at any time, but even more so at this moment. And that number echoes a national trend in a rise of those who are making a commitment to join their future to the Jewish people. College students are flocking to Hillel's and Chabad houses across the country in record numbers. According to the New York Times, long-standing members of synagogues are engaging in more services and activities than ever before. Hint, hint. <laughs> Jewish schools and camps are welcoming an influx of new families. Philanthropists see a rise in giving not just for needs in Israel, but also for Jewish education and identity in America. Jews are seeking community by showing up and joining congregations at levels not seen in decades. People are taking their Magain David, their Jewish star, their Chai out, not tucking it in because they want to show up as their full selves. They don't want to hide who they are. They are, we are Esther, answering the call of Mordechai when he tells her, who knows if you were put here for such a time as this. In the story of Purim, Queen Esther had the power and opportunity to save the Jewish community from annihilation if she had the courage to speak up. And she did. How? She listened to the still small voice inside her. Each of us has that same still small voice inside us. Each of us needs to listen to that voice and answer its call. It is calling us to double down and to show up. What does that look like? We express pride in our Jewish heritage. Wear your Magain David or other Jewish symbols. We embrace Jewish practice, traditions, and culture. Learn to bake challah, hamantashen, and mandel bread. Celebrate Shabbat and holidays. Join us in the sukkah next week or come dance with us on Simchat Torah. Learn more about Judaism and Israel. We have awesome teachers here at Washington Hebrew. Transmit your family stories to your children and grandchildren. They are your legacy. Live our Jewish values as we work to repair the world. When we feel more secure in our Judaism, we have the confidence to stand up. We are climbing our collective Morrow Rock, and the strength is within us. Washington Hebrew is responding to this moment. Our clergy are working side by side with our anti-Semitism committee. We have been teaching classes in partnership with the Anti-Defamation League, hosted speakers like Franklin Four, organized vigils, partnered with area clergy to call for an end to anti-Semitic action. We have been showing up in our local schools, on college campuses, and in public spaces. In 1898, Mark Twain wrote, all things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? It is no secret to us. We know we are stronger when we stand together, when we celebrate together and mourn our loved ones together, when we sing, dance, and eat our way through the holidays, just not today. <laughs> it is the joy of Judaism, the joy in Judaism that is our secret. At every Jewish wedding, we break a glass to remind us that the world is not yet whole and that we need to work for a better tomorrow. And then we go out and do just that. 
Long ago, I learned about the sequoias in California. Some of these magnificent trees, which are as tall as a skyscraper, have roots practically at surface level. A lone sequoia's roots are so shallow that it can hardly stand up to a strong breeze. So how do they grow so tall? They spring up in groves, and their roots intertwine. And I witnessed that this summer at Sequoia National Park. I was mesmerized having, ob observing firsthand what I have long taught. These giant trees hold each other up. They give each other the strength necessary to withstand the angriest winds. And it is the same with us. When we are together, we can withstand anything. Look at us. We are still here. After 5,785 years, we have survived the destruction of two temples, holocausts, pogroms, exiles, and expulsions, and we have thrived. We stand tall, tall together. After my successful hike up Morrow Rock this summer, I had to challenge myself again. I knew I could do it. I could be scared and be brave all at the same time. We went to Yosemite and we hiked Pothole Dome. Not the biggest mountain in the park, but it is all relative there. Reaching the summit was amazing. The wind was strong and alive, and I could see so far beyond what was right in front of me, beyond the obstacles I had to overcome to get there. My sight was boundless in this expanse I could hear the still small voice inside me telling me, you always knew you could do this. And I knew I was on top of the world. Amen. We are.